Okay, so uh, um, I can call a little later. Well, Mary, what I need to check. I couldn't get hired. Absolutely couldn't get hired here. And I was standing on the corner of Wilshire Boulevard and I don't know, Bedford or something, and I was look I looked over at Magnus and I said, I better get a job because I have a thousand dollars in my bank account and it's going fast. So I walked over and I had a job the next day. What were you doing with it? I was selling budget dresses. <laughs> until Miss Betty kicked me out of the uh, the alter alter alteration room. See Miss Betty lately? Actually, it's such fun now to go back and see Miss Betty. She's still got her blue hair. She's got, still got a little white collar, a little black dress, and I go and buy from her now. <laughs> well, it was embarrassing playing the first six years for the Red Sox. Uh, you know, uh, you went into a city and you played four games, and uh, the other team didn't win three out of the four. You know, they'd be ticked off because uh, we might have won two games. And, uh, you know, we lose 100 games a year or close to it. And it was embarrassing, you know, I hated to put the Red Sox uniform on. Here you're representing uh, Boston, New England, and uh, people are laughing at you. Uh, well, six years were tough, it really were. You're 43 years old and one of the most successful men in your profession. And then at a time when most men are in the prime of their working careers, you retire. Now you have to find something to fill that huge gap in your life. Well, that's the current situation facing Carl Yastrzemski in this, the spring of his last season as a baseball player. Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, the man they call yes, we love him. Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, Carl Yastrzemski, what power he has. Those rival pitchers on the mound all shake. They dread each windup that they have to take. When number eight is standing at the plate, and any swing, whoa!
Oh, this is pretty. All this Spanish moss on the trees. And yeah, we just sit on a dock and fish a live bait here, actually. Oh, do you? What kind of bait do you use? Uh, just shiners. What's that? <laughs> Uh, it's a bait that swims around. You need to catch uh, largemouth bass or oh my god, this is little stripers. Is this is will this hold me? Yeah. Oh dear. You know I can't swim either. Do you buy these or catch okay, these? No, buy them. You can catch them. We we'll just go to the store and buy them. The bait shop. It's easier. Suck them to the back and let them swim around. You had decided that you were going to have this as your last year. Is this going to be it? Oh, I've made that decision at the end of last year that this would be my last year. There's no possible way that uh, if I can't help the ball club, I'm going to sit around on a bench, you know. Uh, that's not me playing every day, working as hard as I have for 23 years and doing the job. Uh, it would just tear me up inside. Uh, I would never hang on. What are you going to do, Carl, after you quit the game? I have a long-term contract with Collins and Hillshire. Uh, I'll work with them. I'll work with the Red Sox in some capacity. Uh, Sully and I haven't really sat down and talked about it yet. But uh, I guess the first year, uh, I just kind of want to do nothing. Uh, That's what you're saying now. Well, I've had it, you know, where I, there's a lot of things I want to do. Uh, the only traveling I've done in 23 years is, you know, flying in an airplane and going to a hotel room from the hotel room to a ballpark. Uh, I haven't seen this country. I like to take a Bronco and uh, hook it up, hook up a bass boat behind it and just go right across uh, the United States uh, one summer. How do you feel about the road and, and some of the disadvantages of being on the road and its effect on your family? I bet you missed a lot. Well, of course, you know, birthdays and things like that. There's a lot of uh, occasions that you miss, school plays and so forth. But, uh, you know, Carol did a super job raising the kids. Uh, and then during the uh, wintertime, uh, you know, you're, you're home most of the time, so all kind of even out. Uh, I guess it goes with uh, any uh, profession where uh, a person wants to get ahead. He's going to have to travel and be away from his family. It's, Is there any single that moment that you, that you regretted that you were away? Uh, that you can think of? You wish you'd said, ah, oh, take a pass on baseball. I wish I'd been there. Yeah, I'd like to have uh, spent more time with my son, you know, uh, helping him develop more into a ball player. Uh, because you can't do it. Is this Mike you're talking about? Yeah. You can't do it when you're away, you know. Uh, you can't do it with a telephone because it's not that simple uh, just to look at a guy and say, this is what you're doing wrong. Uh, We've been hearing rumors that uh, there's a possibility that you might buy Buddy LaRue out in the Red Sox. Is that just a rumor or is there something no to No chance. <laughs> Where that started from, we haven't uh, even discussed it. Uh, Would you like to be an owner of the Red Sox? Would I like to be an owner of the Red Sox? No. Why? Uh, <laughs> Well, it just won't happen. Uh, I just like to work. work you mean on. you mean owners don't work? <laughs> I said the Red Sox don't work. <laughs> I would imagine that's pretty hard work. Well, it's it's uh, you know uh, owning a ball club. It's not as simple as it looked. I you know I had the greatest owner in the world, Tom Yawkey, for 18 years. I guess that's why I played so long, uh, because my friendship with him, that, uh, you know, one individual owned the ball club, uh, wasn't 10 owners, 15 owners, where you had to report to, and uh, it was fun coming to the ballpark, it wasn't a job, uh, because he'd sit and wait for me every day when I come into the ballpark, and we'd sit and talk about fishing, uh, hunting, uh, the ball game, he was very enthusiastic about the game, knew the game, uh, as well as anyone I ever met. If you had to recall a moment, Carl, just one special moment that you had with Tom Yonke, what would it be? Well, I'd have to say uh, when my mother came down with cancer and, uh, uh, you know, we, the reports came back uh, and he knew about it and came right down to the clubhouse. Uh, you know, get the best doctors, don't worry about it, uh, best possible medical attention. And, uh, he was as concerned as I was, and I, I guess that's why he was such a great owner. Uh, every day, he and uh, Mrs. Yawkey would go visit my mother, and she was in the hospital for seven weeks. Carl, where were you, and what were you doing when you heard that Mr. Yawkey had died? It was at the ballpark. As a matter of fact, we just uh, uh, we just finished 
batting practice, and uh, uh, Sully called me from upstairs into the clubhouse and said, uh, uh, Mr. Yorkie just died. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I think someone came down and told the ball club about 10 minutes later. Everyone in the whole clubhouse, you know, just broke down. Did you have to go off and be by yourself, or was it better to be with the other players? Well, I went outside. I sat in the players' parking lot for about 15 minutes. Uh, came kind of a surprise because I received a note from him a few weeks previous to that. And, you know, he's always very optimistic. And in the note, he said, you know, might, might be here for a couple more years to see that World Series yet. Lakeland, Florida, the Detroit Tigers, and most probably the beginning of Carl Yastrzemski's last exhibition series as a player for the Boston Red Sox. exactly the way one who takes his work seriously wants things to turn out. But Carl will have a season full of times at bat, and each one will serve as a reminder that at age 43, Carl Yastrzemski faces perhaps his toughest decision. How will he fill the second half of his life? Show business excitement is second nature to Los Angeles and New York, but we have our share of it in Boston, too. And this being Boston, when we get excited, we do it in a very civilized way. Joan Kennedy and I produce a television announcement promoting a benefit for the Metropolitan Center. It's a special preview performance of Noel Coward's Private Lives at the Schubert across the street. Now everyone knows the play stars Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton, and it promises to be a glittering event and very civilized. In its first year of operation, the Metropolitan Center brought entertainment to more than a million people. Now the center needs our help. On April 8th, a benefit performance of Private Lives starring Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton will be held to support the Mets. The big night finally arrives, complete with searchlights, a red carpet, and lots of Bostonians dressed to the nines. Very, very civilized. And then... <laughs> up there, and of course are quite civilized. <laughs> One wonders what that most civilized of men, Noel Coward, would have thought of all this. Fame like Elizabeth's, Richard's, and Carl Yastrzemski's can be wonderful, as you've just seen, but it can intrude on your private life. Well, now I want you to meet a star who is determined to have her fame and her family privacy as well. Boston's the scene for this limited series, in this case, only five weeks long. 
it seems there's this Boston TV station, number three in the news ratings, and it has a relationship problem between its two co-anchors, played by Bill Bixby and Mariette Hartley. Now, if it catches on in the spring tryout, Goodnight Beantown just may be back as a regular series next season. Although the show is all about Boston, it's actually shot at the Warner Brothers Studios on the West Coast. So in order to get together with Beantown star Mariette Hartley, I had to travel all the way to Tinseltown, where I spent the better part of two days seeing what it's like to be a star many people think of as James Garner's wife. And you're really the scene stealer in those commercials. Everyone thinks you're his wife. Yes, I went through that phase. I go through a lot of phases. Frigid Doctors was my first stage. Is that in Peyton Place? Yes. Uh huh. And all the, uh, and the Plain Passive Sisters. And now, I, then I was Jimmy Garner's wife. World's simplest camera. Polaroid's one step. The funny name for a camera. One step? What's the matter with it? Sounds like a short ladder. I had sworn I would never do another commercial for scale as long as I lived, and I got a call for Polaroid the next day. Um, I just, I had no, no idea, uh, and I had to be talked into it. I said, I don't want to do another scale commercial. I thought the one step was your idea. I made a few suggestions. The camera you never focus? No, they thought of that. The motor that hands you the picture? That was theirs, too. What did you do? Why don't you ask me about the little red button? Red? You thought of red? We were talking about uh, you working with Bill Bixby and, and becoming his wife in The Incredible Hawk and thus getting an Emmy. Mm -hmm. How did you get that job, and did you think that that role would award you an Emmy? No, I mean, The Incredible Hulk. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just, uh, uh, it was a lovely role, and I, I must say, I had a heck of a good time doing it. Um, it was very well written, it was beautifully directed by, you know, Ken Johnson, who had done a lot of other shows before that. Um, but I, I, as a friend of mine from the Blue Ribbon panel said, there was not a lot of comment. Mariette Hartley, the incredible Hulk, Mary. Holy cow. Um, this is a very special show to me because I just had a little baby girl and she was with me for three weeks. She was only three weeks old, so I guess you can do both. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, thank you, Ken Johnson, for, for being there and for writing and producing and directing. And thank you, Bill Bixby, for being an absolutely wonderful co-star. John McPherson for lovely camera work. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Arlene. Thanks to my beloved husband, Patrick, and Sean, and my beautiful little Justine, who had to put up with ice cream instead of mother's milk a lot of the time. <laughs> Thank you. Sunset Boulevard. I tag along and witness more of Marriott's professional life. It's a day filled with appointments and business-related chores. Now this time, we join her publicist and a syndicated columnist for an interview about Goodnight Beantown. And knockers out to here. I hmm. still remember not being able to walk real well. Where do you get those from? Oh, I mean, this the wardrobe. Is a wardrobe. wardrobe. Oh, I yes. Okay. I could hear Sam always saying, oh, and they come in and they keep patting me and patting me. Mm. I, I literally could not walk. I mean, those are different kind of things, not walking around with a huge yeah. cod piece. Your yeah, depth perception was totally thrown off. Right? Oh, you just, oh, totally. I see. I have no depth perception. <laughs> you don't understand that. I see. Um, so anyway, uh, neither does my husband, and that's a very lucky thing for me. <laughs> On the second day of my visit to Los Angeles, Marriott and I perform a chore shared by millions of American mothers, the carpool. She's one star who insists on maintaining a full and active family life. And to me, her most impressive career accomplishment isn't the many awards she's won, but the balance she maintains between family and her work. Okay, you don't want Lisa's boots, Cammie. Jeez. The real thing that we do, which I feel is important, we don't go out at night when we work. We stay, we go right home and we are with those kids and we all cuddle up in the big bed and we talk and we have our real quality time. And I have special time with both kids if I can do it. That's about 20 minutes with Justine and 20 minutes with Sean by themselves. And uh, I would have it no other way. 
After we arrived back at Marriott's home, the children, Sean and Justine, went out to play. And Marriott and I had a moment to share a private part of her home and her life, a well-hidden wall of fame of which she's very proud. Then this is my Polaroid wall. We had to have a Polaroid wall. Uh, this was the night of the Clio. They made me a Clio cake. And it's my husband acting like Napoleon. And this is the whole first team. And that's uh, the grotesqueries of what happens <laughs> behind the scenes. And that was a gag. One Which can only hope it was a gag. Shoot this? No, that was shot. Oh, that was for some other thing. We just put it up there. Maria, where do you keep the, the Cleos and that Emmy? Oh, at the other side of the house and a bunch of junk. Oh, Want to see it? Oh, I yeah. <laughs> I love this kitchen. These are my, this is my, my heart, this room. I've got everything that no one else will, will want in any other place, because it doesn't look great. So I've got... Oh, look at these little shoes yeah, here. This is my daughter's first, first pair of red shoes, and these, this was my very first pair of red shoes. No bronzing. No bronzing. I don't like bronzing. <laughs> uh, this is my, There's this is the, the Emmy. Emmy for uh, uh, Married. This is my proclamation. Oh, this is my Staples class Emmy reunion. Is. Can I just pick it up? Oh, sure. Oh, my gosh, it's heavy. It's nice, isn't it? The national Emmys are heavier than the local Emmys. Really? I have to tell you. Yeah. Oh, this is a national one, right? Yes. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> These are all the Cleos. Then they have all the names of which one, which ones they are. And they put titles on each yes, of the commercials? Yes, uh-huh, on each. Because sometimes the titles are funnier than the commercials. What's this one called? Bonus Mary? Bonus Mary, and I think that was one I did by myself. And a funny name. Oh, no, I don't remember which one that was. Oh, it's a funny name for a camera. I remember well, a one that. step. It's a funny name for a camera. It's like a short ladder. Yeah. And then uh, warm up the party. Oh, that's the one where I say, no party. And he says, no, no party. I said, no party. <laughs> so I got that one. Of course, that this, is, this is my mom as a young woman. And then I've got all kinds of stuff here. Who is this guy here in the clown suit? Oh, this is, you know, we picked this up, I don't know, I think it was in Boston somewhere, as a matter of fact, Philadelphia. And a funny old story, because a friend of ours collected all kinds of strange puppets and dolls. So, and we've never given it to him. We can't find the man now. So we have this silly thing here. With, it's Nixon with his tapes, right? Oh, I don't know. It's just insane. I don't know where the hell to put it. <laughs> Want to see my gold camera? I'd love to see it. Is it really gold, Mary? Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people buy these things, but they, they're great as gifts. Okay, if you stand. You gonna take my picture? Yep. Stand. Uh... Where do you want me to stand? That's good. Is this the one step? Hmm? No, this is the SX-70. Now, I don't know. It may not. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. I may not have enough light. But the You're not going to sit here and wait for that to develop. It's difficult not to respond to the warmth and sincerity of this lovely woman. And as I get to know her, I can't help wondering if she hasn't found the secret. Perhaps she can have it all. But what if Goodnight Beantown succeeds and becomes a regular weekly series? Will the workload upset the delicate balance Mariette has reached between her career and her family life? I would love to I'll just have my life be a combination of, of real pleasure with my family and, and work to provide that pleasure. But it also gives me a tremendous sense of nourishment. I come back to the family renewed after I've worked. So it is a nice balance if one doesn't overtake the other. That's the news. Good night, Bean Town. And we're clear. Before we say goodnight, there are just two more special people I'd like to introduce. Now, they don't have recognizable names like Yastrzemski, or faces you'll know right off like Mariette Hartley's, nor do they have fans waiting for them like Elizabeth and Richard. Not yet, anyway. Meet Michael Morris and Brian Williams. Both are students at Berklee College of Music here in Boston. We asked the administration at Berkeley to select some students to write original music for our program. Everything you've heard tonight was composed by Michael and Brian well, under the supervision of Don Wilkins, chairman of the film music department.
We hope you've enjoyed their work. Good night, Bean Town.